Uh, with, thank you. <laughs> Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative stays to submit a written statement or an extraneous uh, materials for the record. And um, I will now begin the committee with my statement. I'd like to welcome this morning's hearing on the federal government's consolidated financial records and statements for fiscal year 2009 and the subcommittee's review of federal agencies' progress to date in modernizing their management systems and internal controls. I welcome our distinguished witnesses and look forward to hearing all of your testimony. The Government Management Reform Act of 1994 instructs the Secretary of Treasury in coordination with the Director of the Office of Management and Budget to submit financial statements on an annual basis to the President and to the Congress. GAO is required to audit these statements and today's hearing will review the findings of the Department of Treasury and OMB as well as GAO's audit. For the 13th consecutive year, GAO was unable to render an unqualified audit opinion for fiscal year 2009 due to ongoing material weaknesses that were caused by problems related to internal controls over financial reporting. The statement of social insurance, however, was issued a clean audit opinion, and the total number of reoccurring material weaknesses, weaknesses held constant at 29, but the overall number of weaknesses documented increased from 32 to 38, mostly due to irregularities in financial management and reporting. The subcommittee would like to hear how the material weaknesses in financial reporting and other internal controls by federal agencies continue to affect the federal government's fiscal conditions. The subcommittee is particularly interested in hearing more from Mr. Millett of the State Department and Mr. Easton from the Department of Defense about their agency's challenges in these areas and their efforts to resolve these issues. The subcommittee is aware of the extraordinary and unprecedented efforts the federal government has undertaken to shore up the nation's fiscal markets in 2009 as well as the fiscal challenges our government faces in meeting its obligations for major social insurance programs that will appear down the road. Obviously, there comes a time when the rubber must meet the road, and many of us would agree, to use a mixed metaphor, that there is a shrinking window of opportunity for implementing necessary policy changes to meet these critical budgetary challenges. And with that in mind, I look forward to the observations of our panel of government witnesses on the current conditions of the nation's financial health, as well as any other observations you may have on what efforts must be made to ensure the ongoing fiscal health of our nation. And for our second panel, we will hear from several expert witnesses regarding Representative Henry Cuellar's legislation, H.R. 2142, or the Government Efficiency, Effectiveness, and Performance Improvement Act of 2009. The intent of Mr. Cuellar's legislation is to build upon the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993 by requiring that every federal program be accessed at least once every five years. The legislation also establishes the Performance Improvement Council and Agency Improvement Offices. Once again, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today, and I look forward to their testimony. And now I will call on our prestigious minority uh, representative. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate um, 
you convening today's meeting uh, on this very important matter. Auditing the federal government's financial statements is a massive responsibility, but a vitally important one. Understanding how and how well the federal government manages and spends our taxpayer dollars will lead to greater transparency for the American people, an opportunity to see where financial management improvements can be made and could potentially save billions of dollars each year. In 1996, only six agencies received a clean audit. Now we are up to 20 out of the 24 CFO Act agencies receiving an unqualified opinion on their financial statements. There is no doubt that some improvements have been made. However, persistent problems remain. For the 13th straight year, GAO was unable to render an opinion on the government's consolidated financial statements due to persistent financial management problems at the Department of Defense, the government's inability to account for interagency funding activity, and other ineffective systems, processes, and internal controls at our federal agencies. In fact, the very agencies that are responsible for public company reporting and tax compliance do not have effective control over their own financial reporting. At the Securities and Exchange Commission, GAO found that automatic accounting systems could not generate useful financial reports, requiring extensive manual workarounds. At the IRS, GAO found that financial management systems failed to comply with the law. One could fairly ask, how can these agencies require effective financial reporting from companies and individuals in the private sector and not practice it themselves? The private sector, which has frequently faced the challenge of reconciling transactions between disparate subsidiaries of a consolidated corporate parent, has developed technology solutions to similar accounting problems. The federal government lags far behind the private sector in implementing and making use of these technological solutions. GAO was able to offer an unqualified opinion on the statement of social insurance, which includes Medicare and Social Security. However, as a recent news story on this topic stated, quote, while the bookkeeping of the statement of social insurance might be reliable, it's hardly good news. The financial statements show that the projected scheduled benefits exceed the earmarked revenues for Social Security and Medicare by $46 trillion during the next 75 years. According to GAO, increased spending and borrowing and decreased revenue associated with TARP and stimulus spending added mass massively to the nation's debt. And GAO states in its report that federal debt held by the public as a share of GDP could exceed the historical high reach in the aftermath of World War II by 2020, 10 years sooner than projected just two years ago. GAO concludes that the federal government is on an unsustainable long-term fiscal path. I am also concerned about the ongoing and growing problem of improper payments. An improper payment is government jargon for a dispersal, dispersal of taxpayer money which should never have been made, a payment that went to the wrong company or organization or that was made for an incorrect amount. In fiscal year 2009, OMB reported that the federal government made $98 billion in improper payments. And OMB admits that this figure doesn't even cover all of the at-risk outlays and therefore doesn't reflect the full total of incorrect payments the federal government made in the fiscal year 2009. With that, Madam Chair, I thank you once again for holding this hearing today. Look forward to the testimony of our panelists and the productive conversation on how we can continue to improve the financial management of our federal government. And with that, I yield back. I now yield to the distinguished member, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think this is uh, my anniversary. I've been here a year now. <laughs> I was expecting a cake. <laughs> the reason I... <laughs> Had I known you were they'll coming. Go watch, they'll tell me what time it is. Uh, what's striking to me in that anniversary date is where I came from. I was a Cook County Commissioner in Chicago. And when I got there 11 years ago, the big scandal was that our Forest Preserve District had not done appropriate audits for five years, and we found out we were $19 million in debt, and uh, we had people on the payroll who weren't attached to the budget. That was seen as an extraordinary problem. Um, uh, I guess fast forward to today, 
it's extraordinarily frightening that the decimal point moves way over to the right, but the fact that we don't know and necessarily uh, we don't have a handle on our finances is all the more frightening. Because um, without proper audits of the federal government's finances, we are essentially flying blind, uh, and it's a big plane. You know, how can we begin to create efficiencies or cut waste if we don't have a proper accounting of where and how our funds are being spent? We have to have an accurate lay of the land before we begin reforming. The path out needs to know where we are in the first place. Um, proper oversight of the federal spending is especially important now. The federal government has taken on unprecedented amounts of debt and liabilities through the stimulus, TARP, uh, including extraordinary investments in Fannie and Freddie. Our national debt as a percentage of GDP is on track to reach levels not seen since World War II due to entitlement growth and unchecked spending. We need some serious reforms to rein in federal spending and put our budget in a sustainable path. All I would say is that that first part of this must be an accounting. It, it must be an appropriate accounting so we know where we are and we know what the changes that we put in place will do to affect our balance sheet. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Do I now yield to the distinguished Mr. Darrell Isa. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding what I hope will be the first of many hearings that uh, begin to grapple with the larger problem. And uh, in reference to larger problem, uh, one of the people that is not given enough his, uh, credit in history for creating the modern government was Dwight David Eisenhower. Uh, he, he began the process of saying that we were going to have to increase the efficiency in using modern technology. Sadly, he went to his grave, and many presidents since him have gone to his grave without the federal government knowing how to use computers to actually do more than put we pretty websites up that tell people how well we're doing. It is, uh, it is sad that we spend as much money as we spend on automation and yet cannot begin to accurately mimic what we demand the private sector do. I hope today that as all of you testify, and I'll be going between two committee hearings of this, two subcommittee hearings of this uh, whole committee, that you'll bear in mind that if we're going to solve this problem, we first have to, as Dwight David Eisenhower used to say, take a big problem and make it larger. It's very clear that there is no central plan for an efficient and effective system of exchanging information within the federal government. That has been pervasive, as the acting GAO would tell us. It has been pervasive in our, in, uh, in our intel community. It has been a problem at DOD at all levels. And of course, if we can't get it right, we cannot work with our allies around the world to exchange information to keep America safe. So I, as though, although I uh, consider this problem a huge problem, I would hope today that we begin to focus on the fact that unless there is a strategic plan to solve this problem through transparency and interoperability so that the roll-up of an organization, if today you're part of Homeland Security and tomorrow you're part of an entire different cabinet position, that it should be as transparent as simply saying this is now being redirected with a few strokes uh, of the keys to another department. Today, it would be hopeless to consider that. As a matter of fact, there would be a plan of probably three to five years in order to transition so that something could be done other than manually. I've looked at your testimonies. I look forward to uh, repeated follow-ups. I would ask the chairwoman that all members, both present and those uh, seated on the committee but not present today, have uh, time to ask questions uh, as follow-ups to today's hearing and that they be answered in writing. Are you referring, uh, Mr. Isa, to to our witnesses? To the witnesses that we be allowed that we be allowed to have follow up because their statements are are very good and I think we're going to probe a long way into it. But as is the customs of the custom of the committee, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have the ability and that we get the acquiescence of the people testifying here today to uh, take follow up questions from any member of the committee. Mr. Isa, you know that is standard procedure, and without objection, 
thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank my, you for reminding us. No, my, it was not for the chair. It was actually for the witnesses. Some of them are not used to getting a committee that, uh, that looks at all this and follows up with numerous questions, sometimes uh, two and three times. And obviously, Mr. Dodaro is very familiar with it, but I asked for that reason. Well, let me reassure you, Mr. Isa, that we definitely will leave the record open, and we're open for your written testimony, as well as your written comments, as well as your response to members' questions. And again, thank, thank, thank you, Member Thank Isaac. you, Madam Chair. You yes, back. now, I now yield to Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Statement. This, on the surface, looks like a fairly small, unconsequential hearing. It's not. We're talking today about one of the most important issues that our entire nation faces. And as important as these auditing issues are, that's really not what's at stake here. What matters is the big picture, the aggregate. And I'm worried that we miss the forest for the trees. A lot of folks back home don't realize that the federal government is the last large entity left in America that refuses to use real accounting, so-called accrual accounting. And in business, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We in the federal government are refusing to use the real numbers, and it's been this way for a long, long time. When David Walker was the Comptroller General, he used to put explicitly in his auditor's letter that the United States faced back in his day some $50 trillion in unfunded obligations. That number has grown. Well, according to my staff's aggregate look at it, it's more like $62 trillion, and it's growing every day. It's growing by about three to six trillion dollars a year. And these are promises that policymakers have made to Medicare recipients and Medicaid recipients and Social Security recipients. And we know today that we do not have enough money to make good these promises. So here we are in a situation in which every stockholder in America gets an annual report on their favorite company. It might be IBM, it might be some other company. But here we are as citizens. Most of us don't even know there's an annual report for our favorite country. And most people are not going to the Treasury or GAO websites and downloading it. Now this year the report was shockingly late. It's been put out in past years at December 15th, and there are probably good reasons for a new administration to be slow getting it out. I still haven't seen a hard copy yet. And here we are well into the 2010. This is fundamental information if you care about the future of America. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, other rating agencies are already talking negatively about the future outlook of the U.S. Treasury bond itself, what Moody's has called the anchor to the world's financial system. We cannot risk a downgrade of the Treasury bond, but that's actually what's at stake. If you read the front page of USA Today yesterday, you saw a shocking increase in debt and that's actually using a conservative measure. If you look at what we are putting on the national credit card, not just in our cash account, it is even more frightening. So the President, by executive order, has appointed a Fiscal Responsibility Commission, a bipartisan group to look into this. I am hoping and praying that people of goodwill in both parties, not only in Congress but across the country, will start paying more attention to these issues. The hearing today on the financial report of the United States government for 2009 is a good way to begin that debate because of these are the only real numbers available to average citizens that use real accounting to talk about our problems. I'm thankful that the statement of social insurance is audited. That's robust. That's ready for a robust public discussion. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for calling this hearing. This is a good way to thank begin. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman, um, and I, uh, I thank you for holding these hearings and thank our panelists for being here. Uh, you know, I, like Mr. Cooper, I, I think this really is a, a very important subject, however arcane for, for some, at least on the surface. Accounting is not always the, uh, uh, the most uh, sensational of, of topics, and yet how we account for federal spending how we account for federal budgeting uh, actually is really critical to the fiscal health of the country as we move forward. And while I agree with my friend uh, on much of what he had to say about accrual accounting and about making sure that there's transparency in what our obligations 
long term are i think it's important we not we not overstate the case the federal government is not about to declare insolvency investments in in the federal in federal debt continue to be robust and if you look at the out years in terms of the interest rate picture it would suggest continuing confidence in the United States as an investor's safe haven that isn't to say that all is well but it certainly is to suggest that you know the sky is not falling we have some time and I think Mr. Cooper's words need to be taken to heart we have some time to act we have some time to make sure our fiscal house is brought into order once this recession is fully accounted for we've had some good news this week it looks like we're going to shave at least three hundred billion dollars off to the projected debt that's good news largely because of improved economic activity it looks like the tarp program that was approved in the previous congress and the previous administration actually may at the most have a net cost to taxpayers not of seven hundred billion dollars originally appropriated but of about eighty nine billion and that's still counting it may yet break even or even turn a slight profit so that's good news in terms of federal spending and the taxpayer but at the end of the day as Mr. Cooper suggests it's really about political will it's about whether both sides are willing to suspend their respective theologies and look at the revenue picture and look at the spending picture in as much of an unbiased way as we can to try to make sure we're willing to put the tough decisions on the table and elect to act on some of them. And as a member of the Budget Committee, I'm committed to certainly doing that as a deficit hawk. And I thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and my friend from Tennessee for constantly reminding us of the seriousness of this issue. And I look forward to the testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to have members of this committee rest assured that this is uh, just part of a uh, continuing group of hearings that will look at the efficacy of the way we spend money, the way we purchase, and the way we address our deficits. We're all keenly aware that we're in a deficit mode that will take years to recover from recession, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel, even if it's a search party with a lantern. So we're gonna try to get to the bottom and find ways to improve how we proceed. And with that said, and no other members present, we're going to proceed on with uh, panel one. Uh, glad to see you, Mr. Cuellar. Uh, would you have an opening statement? Because we are going to be discussing your bill. All right, thank you very much. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify and I'd like to ask uh, all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, uh, and nothing but the truth? Good. Uh, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and I will now introduce each one of you on the panel. Uh, first, we have Jean L. Dodaro, the Acting Controller General of the United States and the head of the Government Accountability Office, the Investigative and Auditing Agency for Congress. Uh, Mr. Dodaro has held such a position as Chief Operating Officer and the head of GAO's Accounting and Information Management Division over the course of his distinguished career with the agency. Next, uh, Mr. Richard L. Gregg has served as the Department of Treasury, uh, at the Department of Treasury with the distinction for 36 years. He also is a commissioner of the Financial Management Service uh, for nine years, and before that served as commissioner of the Bureau of the Public Debt for 10 years. Mr. Craig has also held numerous other management positions as Treasury during his long career. Uh, Danny Werfel serves as a controller of the Office of Federal Financial Management within the Office of Management 
and budget, referred to as OMB. He oversees OMB's initiative to improve financial management across the federal government, including financial reporting and proper payments and real property management. Mr. Worfeld also develops the federal government's policies regarding fiscal accountability standards, grant management, and financial systems. He previously served OMB as Deputy Controller, Chief of the uh, Fiscal Integrity and Analysis Branch, Budget Examiner in the Education Branch, and as Policy uh, Analyst in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. James Millay is a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Global Financial Services at the Department of State. He oversees the Resource Management Bureau, which includes integrated budget planning and performance. He also serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Global Fiscal Services based in Charleston, South Carolina, and which has an integrated fiscal service center in Bangkok and offices in Paris and Washington, D.C., right here in the district. Uh, previously, Mr. Malay was Deputy Assistant Secretary for State Programs, Operations, and Budget, as well as Senior Policy Advisor of the Chief uh, Fiscal Officer. And Mark e., uh, e. Easton is the Primary Advisor to the Department of Defense, DOD, Controller and Chief uh, Financial Officer, and also serves as a Senior Staff Member regarding all issues involving the amended CFO Act of 1990 and related financial management reforms. Mr. Easton is responsible at the executive level for ensuring DOD's budget and financial execution in support of national security objectives, particularly in relation to finance and accounting policy management and control systems and general business uh, transformation programs. He also oversees DOC's compliance with legislative and executive financial management as, uh, initiatives. Previously, Mr. Easton served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Navy and as Director for Financial Operations in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. In 2002, he retired as a captain in the Navy Supply Corps after serving for 29 years. And I want to thank all of you witnesses. And I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief statement of your testimony and keep your summary under five minutes uh, in duration if you can.